Welcome to ANN In Depth. For over 100 years, our mission to the world has been organized by the Executive Secretary of the General Conference. And today, our very own Ayrton Killer is here. Welcome to ANN In Depth. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you, Sam. Ayrton, ever since we restructured in 1901 and 1903, so over 100 years ago, the role of the Executive Secretary was to coordinate our mission to the world, yes. especially to low-entered areas and non-entered areas. You have been in this role now for a few years, and I want to find out how we are doing with our mission. I've heard, I hear you talk a lot about mission refocus, yes. and I, that's the subject that I want to address today. What is mission refocus? What are the main emphasis, and, and what do we expect in the future? Well, you are the one raising the questions for me, but let me raise a question for you. How many hours do we have to talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> this is something that we can spend hours talking about because we have a lot of information, initiatives, and many things. But mission refocus. Number one, secretariat is the one in charge of the mission, the worldwide mission of the church. Since 18, 1863, when the church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, was organized, mission was related to secretariat. The secretary was the one to, to manage the correspondence of the church, the letters and all these things, but mainly focus on the mission. At that time, we didn't have an international mission, but we have a local mission in the United States. Later, we sent the first missionary and secretary was involved on that. But when the church was reorganized in 1912, 1901 and 1903. Oh, let you, me you, correct you. it. <laughs> 1901, 1902, 1903. Yes. Is it right now? That is correct. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> the secretary was much more involved in the worldwide mission. And after that time, we have many different phases of this movement in the church. When we talk about mission refocus, we like to, to evaluate how many mission refocus we had during the church history. And in many times, we invested, invested, invested in the mission, and we start to lose the focus, and church need to come back with realignment of mission. And it's exactly what we are doing now. Mission Refocus is a movement with two different emphases. Number one, we are reorganizing our missionary sending. Just to share some data with you. Two years ago, when we started to work on this movement, we recognize that almost 400 ISCs, that's the name, the, the acronym that we have for our missionaries, we have almost 400 of them working in the field. 82% of them were working in activities that are not or were not related to the frontline work, to the frontline mission. It means important positions, they are needed there, but the term missionary means people opening the work in challenging place of the world. And they were teaching in some of our schools and universities. They are physicians, they are working for ADRA, they are administrators of the church. Again, all important positions. It's probably in places where they need someone coming from other parts of the world to work there. But we believe that we need to use other financial resources to keep those people working in these areas. But money that we need to invest in mission we need to use for those that are working in the front line, opening the work, planting churches in urban areas and many other places. It means we have a project now that in 10 years we are planning to have 70% of all our missionaries that I call ISCs, because again this is the acronym that we have, 70% of them working in the front line, working with urban areas, working with uh, countries and work with people groups. We have three major mission windows that we call. The 1040 window, we'd like to send the major number of them to that area. We have the post-Christian window. It involves some areas of the world where the values are moving far and far from the biblical principles. And number three is the urban area or urban window. Those three windows are our priority. And our plan is to send 70% of our missionaries to work in that area or in those areas to open the work there. This is the first emphasis of Mission Refocus, the reorganization of the missionary sending. And the second one is an invitation for everyone to send missionaries to everywhere. We are trying to, to, to awareness people that they need to understand that the structure of the church is not restricted to one specific territory. 
everybody is responsible for everybody. We are a family. We are all integrated. It means if we have some areas of the world where the mission is growing, we have leadership, we have money, we have church structure and everything, and other areas where we don't have anything, those areas where the church is progressing, they need to help those areas where nothing is happening there. It means if nothing is happening, they don't have leaders, they don't have money, they don't have initiatives. How they can move forward that? Only if others will send some kind of resources or people to them. It means we are calling all the divisions, all the organizations, all the institutions to, to pay attention in the world. And we are helping them to understand the world context and start to send their children, their people, their missionaries, paid by them, sponsored by them, to go to other continents and start to work for the church in those areas. This is mission refocus. Number one, sending missionaries to work in front line. Number two, appealing to the world church that everybody needs to help everybody. Or missionaries from everywhere to everywhere. That's a phenomenal summary of a very complex operation. Let me pull some threads that I yes. heard in this process. So in the first thread, you mentioned that 70% of our missionaries need to go to the front line of mission. And <clears throat> if I understood correctly, there is you, you are creating a distinction between the front line of education, the front line of humanitarian work, the front line of, of medical work, yeah. to the front line of proclamation. Yes. So when you say the front line of mission, you really mean the front line of Bible studies and church planting and our spiritual yeah. goals. Some I, I, I'm always concerned when we talk about this specific subject because all the missionaries that I, I mentioned to you, 82%, that are working in areas that are not frontline mission, they are working in missionary territories, okay? It means in those territories, they don't have leadership. They don't have people specialized in some specific areas and they need to ask for others to come and help them. It means they are in the mission field, but they are not working in the frontline mission. It means they are not planting churches or house churches or training new or new local missionaries and all these things. Our idea now is we need to keep some of them working where they are because they are helping to keep the structure and that structure will manage the work of the missionaries. If we lose the structure, if we lose the leadership, nothing will happen in that place. It means we, we are planning now to keep 30% of all our missionaries in those positions, in the mission field, but not totally involved in the frontline work maybe leading the work, maybe teaching to prepare the new missionaries for those territories, maybe in the health area, maybe in the humanitarian area, because they are very strategic for the church. But we recognize that the major part of our missionaries, they need to be in the front line. And this is the movement that we are managing right now. How is it going? It's going well. I mentioned to you that we have 10 years to implement this project. We are now in the second year. And we have many, many good news. Uh, just uh, 2022 was the first year that we, we started to talk about it. And we appeal for the divisions. If you have some budgets, because we work here with budgets, how many cost one missionary, and we can assign some of these budgets for some divisions, and they can use those budgets for missionary purposes on their divisions. They will manage that. We don't work here micromanaging where they will send people, who will be that person. They can find the person, they can decide the place, and we'll help them to find the right person and send there. We give budgets for the divisions, and they manage that. In 2022, one division returned four budgets for us, saying, you know, we can find local people to manage those areas. That's amazing. We voluntarily? Sending, they did yes, that voluntarily? They sent back four budgets saying, send these budgets for places where they need much more than us. That's amazing. Last year, we had two divisions. One of them returned one budget, and I know that they, they did a huge sacrifice to return that budget. But the message that they sent to us... We are returning that budget because someone that were working for us came back to their territory and we recognize that we can find a local one, the same idea, and we are returning that budget because you can send it to a place without any advantage present or something. And the second division last year surprised us because they sent us back seven budgets saying, 
you know, we, we had some people not working in the front line and we decided to keep some of them in our territory, but we'll pay all the cost. And others, we send them back to their territories. And now here you have seven budgets to use to sponsor missionaries to go to the field. Yeah. I'm talking just about one, one and a half year, and I expect much more. We are sent for some divisions, some. You don't need to return the budgets for us. We are not requesting you to return and return. We are just asking you, reevaluate, mm -hmm. reevaluate them and reassign them. If we have someone working as an example, as a, a university teacher, the question is, could you keep that person there and pay all the cost? And you can use that money to send another missionary inside of your territory, but in a place or for a place where that person will plant a new church, will open the work there. It means... The former missionary will remain there, but you pay everything. And the money that you spent with that person, now we use for someone in the front line. We are appealing to them. If you can return, it will be excellent. We can manage here and send to other place. But if not, reassign it inside of your territory. But be sure that the money that we are investing in missionaries is being investing majorly in those that are working in the front line, opening the work of the church in non-entered or low enter territories. This is a profound shift, and I want to talk about the implication of this shift. Having thought about it for a couple of years, I see that the church has two paths to finishing our mission. One path is to look at the difficult to enter territories and to say, we need to resource the general conference with as much money as possible so that we can send these missionaries everywhere. Mm -hmm. And this means the growth of the administrative structure and the resources at the General Conference. I think there is a degree in which this is very unhealthy. The path that the church has chosen is a different path, is to say the General Conference is not going to fix our problem of reaching unentered territories and, mm -hmm. and so on. We're going to help coordinate. We will absorb our fair share of responsibility in this, but we don't, what we need isn't money. What we need is the right people and the right resources that this division over here or this union over here that God has blessed tremendously with resources to adopt, which is the second part of your of missionary focus, and to send missionaries to these unentered areas and to support this over here and that over there. This is a tremendous shift. Yes. And it also allows for people to take responsibility and to be called by God to effect mission around the world where the general conference isn't the hero at all. Mm -hmm. We may be the guide that helps here and there, but the calling comes to each administrative unit. There are some conferences that are wealthier and have more. And when I say wealthier, I don't just mean money, Ayrton. I also especially mean people, mm -hmm. human resources, multiple generations of leaders that have grown up and are capable of affecting the work in different parts of the world. There are some conferences that have more of that than entire divisions. Mm -hmm. This disparity, I've seen it. It is, it is unbelievable. What you're calling for is for them to wake up, look at the world, and do something about yes, it. Yes, that's the idea. I, I like to divide them, and it's not it doesn't belong to me, just using the terminology that other created. I like to, to, to define them as mission producers and mission consumers. Mission producers are those that you are talking about. They have leadership, they have money, they have structure, they are growing, they are increasing their movement and their structure there. They are producing. They need to start to help those that are mission consumers. They don't have anything. They need to consume it from others. And I need to say to you that something amazing is happening in this area. I have a clear confidence in my heart. And again, it doesn't belong to me. It's from the spirit of prophecy. Jesus will not come only for those that are fulfilling the mission and growing the church in their territory. Jesus will come for the entire world. It means... If in Mexico or in South Korea or in Brazil, everything is working well, the church is growing and we reach all the population, sharing books, using media, social media and everything, it's nice. But what about North Korea? What about uh, other countries? They'll be there. It means they need to, to hear 
God's voice. They need to understand the message. It means if I'm just focused on my territory, I can celebrate that everything is going well, but Jesus will not come just for us. He will come for the entire world. It, it means, is only when the whole world hears. Yes, it that means Jesus everybody needs to work together to say, we are reaching our territory. We are helping to reach the world because we would like to prepare the way for the second coming of Jesus. I like to tell them, you are protagonists and partners. You are local protagonists. This is your major initiative, your major priority, but you are partners with us in the rest of the world. Let us try to keep both initiatives in mind. Good news about it. I will not mention the name of the divisions, just to respect all of them because everybody is doing their best. And when I mention one or two, maybe I will not be correct with their others. Sure. We have one division, for example, that until the end of this year, they will send 50-50. 50 missionary families to other territories, then their territory. They will send them to the world, to Asia. And are they sponsoring those families? And they will pay 100% of the cost. That is of unbelievable. Those, of those 50 families that will leave their territory and will go to Middle East and Asia, basically. Wow. We have a second one. And I'm talking about them and thinking in their names, but I will not mention. The second one. They will send almost 20 families. They will sponsor all Amazing. of them. We have a third one that is one of the divisions that is located in one of the most challenging areas of the world. But they met with all the, 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 the leaders, the local leaders, and they raised an offering for five years. And they are able to send 55 missionary families. They will send a little bit less than 40 for their territory because they have a lot of challenging places there. Everybody is helping to reach part of their territory and almost 20 families they will send to the world. And you can imagine in my, in my mind, we don't have the final numbers because we are talking with them. We are not micromanaging this movement. We are just motivating them. Do what you can do, do what you can do. You can communicate from your division to the next division. You can find the best way to help them, how long it will be, how much money you invest on that. We are just motivating them to do that. It's a very soft movement. But I expect in the next five years, I expect to raise a movement of 200 mission families leaving their territory and going to the world to reach territories that we are not reaching. Again, non-reached or low-reached territories or people groups. You can imagine that. It's a real it's beautiful. huge movement. This is mission refocus in a practical way. Ayrton, we are in this moment in the episode where everything seems great. Movement is happening. I want to bring some data that will destroy this happy moment. Please. There are over 7,500 people groups in the world who don't know who Jesus is. Yeah. It's not that they don't understand the Sabbath. They don't even know who Jesus is. In the major part of them are in Asia. They represent over 3 billion people. Yeah. These are 3 billion sons and daughters of God that have no idea that he has not given up on them and that he's coming back for them. Yeah, you are totally right. Then I go to Chiapas in South Mexico to a GAIN event where there are 1,500 people focused on using technology to finish the work. 80% of them are under 18 years old, Ayrton, 18 and younger. If we are going to finish this work, it means that some of those young people are going to go somewhere else. Mm-hmm. They will use digital, sure, but they will also go in their physical bodies somewhere in the world. But an 18-year-old cannot sponsor themselves. Mm -hmm. They can't even sponsor themselves in their own territory most of the time. So it will require our membership uniting in this sending, in this ekbalo, you know, in this sending out of our missionaries, of our people to different parts of the world. We have a history of this. We've been doing this for over 100 years. Another data for you. You are opening a lot of doors. <laughs> yes. Whoa. There are 400,000 Christian missionaries in the world. These are full-time missionaries working in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. We represent less than 1,000 of them. Mm -hmm. 
for the remnant church that's been called by God to proclaim this to every tribe, every language, every nation, every people group, we do not have any sense that Adventism is leading in this at all. 400,000 missionaries were responsible for less than 1,000 of them. Mm -hmm. I don't think, maybe you do, probably you do, but my feeling is that as a church, we have no idea what Mission Refocus will do. If we take this seriously in the next 10, 15 years, if, if Jesus is to come back in the next 10, 15 years, then this Mission Refocus would be the movement that we need to prepare the way. To prepare. There are some local churches that have more resources in terms of people and finances than different conferences and unions in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. There are some local churches that could send missionaries. They have the funds. Why don't they? But some all things that you are mentioning is just giving me reasons why we need mission refocus. Yes. You know, you mentioned about the people groups and all these things. Our major challenge is the 1040 window. When we talk about the 1040 window, we have two major challenges inside of that window because the 1040 window involves Africa, Middle East, and Asia. Our major two challenges are Middle East and Asia. Middle East, we don't need to speak a lot about that. But Asia, let us imagine Asia. Asia has the most populated country in the world, that is India right now, 1.4 million billion. Inhabit, billion, sorry, inhabitants. Number two, Asia has the most populated state in the world, that's Uttar Pradesh in India, with 240 million inhabitants in one state. Number three, in Asia, we have the most populated city in the world, that's Tokyo, with 37 million inhabitants. In Asia, we have the most populated island in the world, that is Java in Indonesia, with 140 million people there. You can imagine the size of our challenges when we start to think about it. They can't move forward alone. They need to, to receive some extra support to reach those people. You mentioned more than 3,000 or 3 billion people, it's 3.5 billion people that didn't hear about Jesus. That's correct. That's the reason why we need to do something out of the normal. Because if we just move forward, keeping the traditions and the traditions, nothing will happen. We'll stay here for the next millennium waiting for Jesus. It means if we really believe that Jesus will come in our generation, the world is moving to the end together with the, 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 the velocity or the speed of the, the, the final events, we need to work rapidly for the mission to reach those territories. And I truly believe that God will open doors if we start to organize ourselves to do something. Praying and asking for the power of the Holy Spirit, God will open doors and miracles will happen. And the church will move forward. I'm not totally concerned about the number of missionaries. Because for the Lord, He doesn't need a lot of people to do the work. He needs the right people in the right place and will do the work. Gideon and many others can remind us about that. But you talked about the local churches. We are talking about divisions, institutions, organizations in the local churches. They can send their young people as volunteers and they can pay for that. Usually a volunteer, that person, he or she needs to pay the ticket to go to the place where they will go well, easily. Some churches can pay a ticket for a young person. Yes. Number two, they need a monthly stipend to survive in the place where they will be. Generally it, $150. Yeah, $150. Mm -hmm. For some places, it's a high, high cost, but for others, it's not. The mm -hmm. local church can send and send. And if they need some kind of support, they can go to the local field and talk with the global mission director or the secretary, and they can help to, to put them in contact with us. We have a website or a platform called Vivid Faith, vividfaith.com. Everybody can access this platform, and there we are plenty of opportunities for mission around the world, for employees, for volunteers, and many others. They can find a way to go. But I have another concern, and I am promoting it in some areas of the world. We are talking about missionaries, but we also need to prepare local people to take care of the church in some of our territories. And what I'm challenging some local churches is, why not to sponsor a theology student in some of our universities in Asia 
or in the Middle East. They have young people there, good young people that are there, but they don't have the resources. Hmm. They don't have the structure. Maybe a local church can say in Middle East, for example, an ear for a student involving the, the housing, the food, the, 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 the study or the cost of the study. For one year, $12,000. It's not too much. It's $1,000 per month. We can keep a student studying one entire year. And in four to five year, years, sorry, that person will be graduated. That will be a native person speaking the local language huh. without all these international costs that usually you have to send families to other places. Why not you start to think? Sending missionaries, number one, excellent. Number two, sending volunteers. It will be nice. The young people will be changed through the volunteer service in those areas of the world. But why not you start to think to adopt students? Developing young people in or people, Local people. In, in that locality. As, as General so, Conference Secretary at SAM, we decided to do that. We adopted one student, I will not mention the place, but one native student, and we are paying for that student one year to study English because that person needs English to be able to study. One year to study English and four years to be graduated in theology. That person is a local person coming from one of the most challenging countries that we have in the world. And together, as Secretariat family, we are sending the money every month for five years. And our idea is before we start to challenge the local churches, let us do that because it's easy to appeal to others. But we need to, to take the initiative. We are paying. We know the name of that person. We know how that person is going. Every six months, that person is being evaluated to be sure that that person is honoring the money that we are sending to there. And we can imagine that in a little bit less than, than five years, that person will be ready, speaking the language, understanding the culture, how can, can people can be approached. We have many different ways for institutions, for organizations, for families, for young people, for local churches to be part of that. That is absolutely beautiful. Last question, Ayrton. Uh, last time you talked about communication and media. I want to revisit that. Okay. Sometimes going to an unentered area or a low-entered area is very difficult and takes years for local missionaries to build relationships. And you've talked before about media being the entering wedge, a way to build those relationships so that by the time the missionary comes, there is already an interest by a, mm -hmm. a larger number of people that they can then follow up with and, and be more direct in presenting and praying for them and taking care of them and providing pastoral care and Bible studies and so on to start a church somewhere. Mm -hmm. In some areas, that's illegal, so it makes it very difficult. But in many areas, it's not illegal. It's just very difficult. You mentioned Tokyo, for example, and there are many others. Um. You are known for the word integration, <laughs> right? It's hard to listen to you for a while without you mentioning the word integration. How do you see the integration of media and missionaries to affect these difficult territories especially? I think that they can work well together. Integration again, that's the word. I believe that when we are together, we are strong, we can go further, we can arrive faster, and all these things when we work together. I believe that social media can open many doors, many doors. And many of them, the physical missionaries can't open those doors, especially in some place that you already mentioned. I believe that if we can put together media opening doors, preparing the way, reaching out people, creating the first contact and all these things, and missionaries coming later just to, to, to make contact, to integrate with those people, it is an excellent, excellent kind of integration. I already asked for some of our territories, let us start to do some experiences in this area because we are talking and talking some about experiment. it. Some experiments. Experiments. Mm -hmm. We are talking and talking about it, but we don't have an, a prototype, a project that we can say in that place, especially in those closed place or challenging place in the world, we are doing something there. We can invest, maybe some of our missionaries, they will be in that place or they will work from other places just focusing on technology, in media. Mm -hmm. And they will be missionaries. They work there like others that will plant a church, but they will be focused on technology, using technology for mission, and others can come later to start to, to reaping, to harvest all things that technology prepared. I truly believe that this is a great combination 
for integration, and we need to to move forward faster on this direction. It's also not new. You know, no. Abram no. LaRue was a co-porter, sold pamphlets and books, yeah. and South America had media arrive first in, in some, to some degree. Different parts of yes. the world had co-porters go first. Yeah, we are talking about the current media that we have. Yes, yes. of course. Yeah, But we've been one. doing that for and, years. And, and you have a lot of good initiatives around the world. When I yes. say that we need to move faster, it doesn't mean that we don't have things happening. We have a lot of good initiatives. But I'm thinking right now, in those closed countries, in those urban areas that usually are not billion. reaching, those people that we talked about. For those areas, I think that we need to be more intentional. For other areas, things are happening, and we need to applaud some good initiatives around the world. Ayrton, thank you. Thank you for you. It was a pleasure for me. And thank you for listening to ANN In Depth. If you're listening on a podcast platform, please feel free to share this with your friends. And if you're listening on YouTube, Of course, send us a message or a comment or even a question. And we hope that you will follow us in the next episode of ANN In Depth.